welcome to The Truth Lover. This is your host, Will Pye, and this is a presentation of Love and Truth Party. Love and Truth Party is a self-organizing, self-replicating community and movement of love and awakening, a wisdom school facilitating and celebrating the true nature of the human being. We exist to empower the deep realization and integration of unitive consciousness of one human being and to inspire action in the world from this place as new earth ninjas. We do so in the spirit of play, holding the paradox that all is well, even and including all collective crises, while simultaneously being moved to act, to lessen suffering and serve the creation of conscious culture and society. Our projects include distributing a million love letters from the universe, inviting people to receive love and care in these and within the happiness hacks and other resources found on loveandtruthparty.org. The idea is simply to receive and then pay it forward in a social experiment of what it is to be the change. And we are fortunate and thrilled today to be joined by Joe Hudson. Joe is the founder and managing director of One Earth Capital. Joe uses his experience in business and personal development to conduct workshops and lead one-on-one for leaders one-on-ones for leaders working at the intersection of business and self-discovery. I know he's got some exciting weekend courses. He's going to speak to us a little bit about later on. He has over 20 years of corporate experience in helping build companies in personal development, sustainable agriculture, and financial services, and has worked closely with a diverse array of organizations, including Barclays Global Investors, Wells Fargo Bank, the Bureau of Reclamation, as well as smaller entrepreneurial companies across six continents. Joe has committed himself to a life of self-exploration and inner reflection across neurological, psychological, and spiritual platforms. You can learn more about Joe on joehudson.com. He's also a father and husband and a great guy, and it's a joy to be in, in dialogue with you, Joe. How are you today? I'm great. But, you know, that whole intro, that whole love and truth party, forget it, man. I'm not interested. Yeah, not, not your cup of tea. All this love and truth thing. Right. We're just here to, to, to make money and have sex because that's Yeah, the, that's right. Hey, make money and have sex. That's what I'm here for. That's the title of our dialogue. We, 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 we thought long and hard, uh, <laughs> not at all, about what we were going to speak about. And sex, money, and awakening was what we came up with. That certainly uh, seems pretty, pretty juicy. And you, you have an interesting foot in two worlds and you have a venture capital background and you also work with groups within the, within the sort of spiritual space. I know a lot of spiritual teachers and a few venture capitalists, but not people who are in both worlds, who yeah. are in that personal transformation and the making of money. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where I landed. I, it, it, it's not quite as divergent as it sounds in the fact that like everything I invest in both philanthropically and, and in the non and the for-profit space is all about awakening in one level or another. It's, you know, definitely different kinds of uh, technologies or tools that help humans transform. So everything I do is around that. I'm super focused on that, but how I do it is very different. Sometimes it's through investment. Sometimes it's through philanthropy. Sometimes it's working in corporations and sometimes it's working in courses or one-on-one with people. Yeah. And there's a beautiful clarity in that. And anyone that knows you sees the, the integration and the synthesis in that. And you've played a part in supporting Love and Truth Party. I recall a while back you said to me, well, I'm not sure if uh, you're going to be able to make money from this, but I think you may have a movement or something like that. And I thought, well, great. A movement, a movement sounds good. A movement, <laughs> a movement would be a good start. And to explore what it is to be in sacred activism, what it is to be changed. Clearly you're impacting and contributing in a, in a, 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 wide, a wide array of areas of impact. What, what, what's behind that? Why the interest in consciousness? Why the interest in uh, awakening and sex and money? Yeah, the, the, well, the, the interest in, the, in, the, in consciousness and awakening is, you know, it started off as a, you know, trying to escape myself. That's where it started. And then it turned into um, finding myself. And then it turned into wanting other people to find themselves, which had a little tinge of trying to save people. Um, and then it became like, well, I need a purpose. So here's the purpose is to, you know, make awakening normal or ubiquitous. And now it's just none of that shit is, is really real for me. What's just left is, you know, this is 
this is my passion. This is what I love doing. And so this is what I do, you know, and, but it, it doesn't have the righteousness that it used to have or the, the arrogance that it used to have. It's just now like it's art. That's the best way I can describe it. It's just the art form that, that moves through me. And, and play, I get the, 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 the lightness in that there's no world to save, but there's a great deal of joy and fun to be had in the, in the exploration and in, in the creation of this art. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was, I think there's a couple phrases that come to mind. I think once Voltaire, he said, God is a comedian playing to an audience too afraid to laugh. <laughs> I like, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Hopefully an audience is becoming less afraid as we <laughs> wake up and realize the joke. Yeah. Well, you know, I was just talking to somebody, I was talking to an executive this morning and um, we were talking about making decisions and it was interesting the recognition they had was that every time they actually thought there was a decision to be made, there was fear every uh -huh. time. Right. Cause we, we, we make a thousand decisions today, but we never make them a day. Like we, we're going to do this. I'm moving my hand like this. I didn't make a decision to do that. I'm not making a decision to say the words that I'm saying, but, um, but when you go, Oh, which do I do? Do I do this or do I do that? It's instantaneously, you know, you're in fear mm -hmm. just having that there's already fear in there. So, it's just an interesting thought process. If you really think about that, how much fear there is, and you think about how many decisions you're, you know, concerned about. And the difference between being in flow and being in too much mentation, too much thinking about the, the good and the bad or what could go wrong. Yeah, I don't, I don't call it too much because then there's like a good and a bad in, in, in the self. So I wouldn't say too much, but I think it's, really cool to feel the fear when you're in that place instead of right what we normally do is we say okay i'll figure it out right which is like ridiculous neurologically speaking mm -hmm. neurologically like if i pulled out the emotional center of your brain like you would cease to make decisions your iq would maintain the same and there's a great book on it called descartes error um, mm -hmm. written in 2012 and and if, if I pulled it out, it would take you like a half an hour to decide what color pen to use or four hours to decide where to have lunch. And we, but your IQ would maintain the same, right? Mm -hmm. But we're trying to figure out decisions. But when we're figuring out decisions, all that really is is an indicator that we're in fear. And the better thing, better, the, the, the good experiment to try would be to explore the fear rather than to try to find the answer and see right. what happens then, yeah. Which brings us into the feeling center, which brings us into the body in the present moment rather than too much thinking, which seems to be a bias in our culture. Yeah, and, and in most meditative, current meditative traditions, yeah, um, it's very head oriented. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you think about it that if we just like move into the sex and money thing, like, it's, it's our nature to feel. And a lot of people, I know that when I first started meditating, the whole meditation was like to manage my emotions. It was, it was just another management structure, right? I, I wasn't meditating, like sitting around and enjoying it, meditating. It was like, I was trying to manage myself. How do I get into a state of awareness? How do I get into a state of bliss? How do I get into, right? And, and luckily, yeah, <laughs> luckily, that just slowed the process down. It didn't stop it. Um, but it's our nature to feel like there's no moment that we've existed in awakeness and, and like where our eyes are open, where there isn't a feeling moving through us. Right? It's mm -hmm. just, this is what we do. We feel just like what we do is we think and what we do is we have kinetic experience, kinesthetic experiences. What we do is we want sex. Like we are, that's what we do. What we do is we want to accumulate security. That's what we do. We are, not unlike squirrels in that way. Like it is our nature to do these things. And for whatever reason, there's whole aspects of spirituality that say we're just gonna sublimate that part of us. Which doesn't work out too well in a lot of spiritual communities where that sort of shadow of sex and money then comes out in other places where it's perhaps less healthy and, and, and less conscious. Yeah, there's the shadow of it. There's also like, I don't know any, any, any of my friends who are running monasteries who like aren't, aren't considering money, right? So I, I get there's a deep beauty in the practice of saying, I am going to personally just give up money so that I can find myself without that. Like I get that as a, as a, as a temporary experiment, I get it. 
or the temporary experiment of like, what is life without sex, right? M many of the llamas that I know, they have kids. So it's this very interesting phenomenon, but we have, and we, in our nature, we have, our humanness is to have sex. Our humanness is to accumulate security. Our humanness is to, now it, does it get distorted? Sure. Is there things to learn from abstinence? Absolutely. Does fasting make sense? Sure. But the idea of like, when I illumin eliminate my desire for sex, when I eliminate my desire for security, then I'll be free. That's, that's ridiculous. Like that. It's not that the, the desires are there. It's our relationship that, to the desire. And ignoring our humanity isn't awake. It's, it's subjugated. Right. So being more aware of our desires, being more aware of our emotional experience. I do feel in, and certainly see in my own experience that the desire for security via money is, is, is flawed. And I think the data is pretty supportive of that. You know, there's oh, the, sure. people with 10 million who feel that just, just that extra one or two, then they'll feel safe and secure. And I know in my own experience have been times where I've had very little but have felt very secure and financially safe. So there's oh, something, yeah. something deeper going on than the, than the money in the bank. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so by, by no means am I saying like you can fuck your way to heaven or you can like accumulate your uh -huh. money, accumulate money uh, th into heaven. Like, no, nah, I mean, obviously the data, you know, just go hang out with some rich people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, it's all pretty darn apparent and we have a nature. Mm -hmm. and and to to deem it as wrong and then to try to control it is it's you know at the end of i i do this 18 month course and i do it with like there's zen priests and there's ceos and there's you know world famous artists who come to this course and at the end of it what struck me was that i mean i i i, I get emotional thinking about it you know, what they said was they said, you know, thank you for teaching us how to be human. You know, yeah, they, they had awakenings. Their, their idea of themselves collapsed in some cases that, you know, they saw that their, the unity was there. But what they were grateful for wasn't that. What they were grateful for was falling in love with their humanity, humanity with mm -hmm. their own humanity. Mm -hmm. so it's not even awareness of it. It's falling in love with it, you know. Mm -hmm coming into the harmony and the recognition of the beauty of the desires of the movements of the whole self structure of the psychology and the whole emotional experience. I know that's a big part of your work when we've been in conversation has been to really open up to the validity of the entire range of, of emotional experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, it's like the relationship to it, right? So, you know, two people are on a roller coaster and one is scared shitless and one is excited and they're having different physiological responses. The scared one is having cortisol course through their system. It is carcinogenic. One is having anti-carcinogenic chemicals running through their system. Same experience, right? Similarly, you know, we feel sex drive. Like that's the roller coaster. Or similarly, we have emotion. Or similarly, we desire security. Our relationship to that is what determines our experience. It's not the ride itself. Right. And, and to say, okay, I'm not taking the ride. Right. That, that, you know, then you're like sitting on the roller coaster, like, you know, like halfway down the thing, just sitting there, like the tension is constant. Right. But there's also like, wow, this is all, I can fall in love with my desire, my desire. I can fall in love with my desire. Mm -hmm. not, my, not my craving. Craving very is very different in my world. You know, I don't know what the actual definitions would be according to whoever's listening, but, but the craving is like trying to fulfill it. And there's a way of sitting with desire of just being in love with the desire for, and that experience is very, very, very much like love. If there's any differentiation at all. For me, there's a distinction maybe around craving coming from a, a place of lack or a feeling of lack or a feeling of insufficiency or, or a feeling of discomfort that I'm trying to uh, numb or dull. But desire in its pure state is that sort of that eros, that movement of, of, of love, that movement of creativity to, to, to become more, to create, to experience, to 
um, to, to contribute all, all natural and beautiful aspects of our humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And I would fall and I would put like sex and accumulation of security into those beautiful aspects of humanity. If they're not being used, as you said, you know, to compensate or to avoid or. I'm, I'm interested for you. How has that changed or evolved as consciousness has expanded or awakened? Has sex become better? Has sex become more important, less important? How is your relate? Maybe we'll start with sex. Yeah. Yeah. Sex. That's good. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh shit. My, my sex early on in life was just all fucked up. You know, it was, it was, it was definitely, there was all sorts of childhood trauma around it and it was, it was brutal. Um, my awakening experiences really didn't shift it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but then as I started to like deepen into what is life like from that perspective, what is, what is it as I start accepting everything? Then, then there was like the, the, the sexual cravings became less, but the sexual movement became greater, right? Because it was stopped being repressed. So there was like this movement that happened around sexuality, like that energy just flowed a lot more freely. It often got confused in different stages in the developmental cycle where you know, I would confuse other forms of love with sexual desire. I think that's really common experience um, for people. I, I know it is. I see that a lot. There's a lot of confusion when people start feeling that the the joy and the and the bliss of life, just the simple bliss and joy of life. It's often confused with sexuality. Um, you know, I went through a time where I just had this uncontrollable urge to kiss all these people because I was falling in love with the world. And it was like, took me some time to see, oh, the, these are actually different emotions that I'm, that I'm, my, my system is confused about. Yeah. When we're playing with, with consciousness and awakening and we're in community and these heightened states of heart opening and connection are feeling in our bodies tingling and it's all yummy and delicious. I, I can relate to both, uh, being in confusion around my perception of others and also noticing others perhaps getting a little bit confused in their perception of me because I'm in a state that's arising rather than uh, taking responsibility for that love being entirely their own and having nothing to do with, with, yeah. with the teacher or, or, or the facilitator or the coach. Oh yeah. Especially in the, you got two things going for you in that role. You know, you have like the, 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 you know, like you're coming, if you're, if, if, if it's like me, you're walking into the room, just your, your thing is to love everybody in that room. So there's that confusion. Then there's the power bit, right? Which mm -hmm. is like, and so there's a lot of times in, in, in our line of work where people, you know, get confused and they want it to be sexual and they want to feel that level of fulfillment. It happens like it's, yeah. I'm glad we've added power along with sex and money. It's like the, yeah. the, the holy trinity or the, the holy untrinity that be, being brought into consciousness. So how do, you, how do you work with that skillfully? How do you be in love? How do you be in that uh, heart open space whilst also being in integrity and being in clarity? And is that just a, a case by case? I don't know if it's a how. Yeah, I mean... There's something, I mean, obviously uh, continually pointing back that the love is in them and that what they're seeing in me is a projection. Mm -hmm. I mean, constantly pointing that out is really useful. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a time in the teaching process where you allow the projection onto you mm -hmm. um, because it helps them fall in love with themselves. And there's a time in the teaching process where you stop that projection onto you. And so I think, you know, whichever destroys the ego better at the moment, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, but at the end of the day, the whole thing is a mirror coming back. And, th and then the other thing is you've got to be clear, right? Like every time, if there's a hook in me with a student, whether, you know, I'm, I'm fantasizing or I, you know, feel attacked by, or I, I feel, 
special because of or what, whatever that is to me that's like oh here's a place for me to you know clean my clock so to speak right this is a place where my tube can become more hollow and here's something that i'm not loving in myself right there's right. there's every one of those things shows me that there's a way that i haven't fully loved, fallen in love with my human experience uh-huh so i'm hearing there there's that path of of learning that unfolds. I know you've spoken about the joy of, of teaching or the joy of facilitating. Yeah. And there's also, I, I can certainly relate to that. Someone asked me last night in, uh, in San Rafael, said, what, how did you get to where you are? Why do you do what you do? And the, the, lo- the short answer was because I love it. It's just an absolute joy to be exploring yeah. consciousness, to be right. utilizing words to describe the ineffable, to be in this play. And there's also, um, a sense of, um, I completely lost my train of thought with that. Mm-hmm. There, was, there, was the, there was the joy of it and there was something else around why we're in that space, why we're in the communication. He asked you in San Rafael, he asked you what made it that you did, how'd you find yourself here was your... Yeah, there was a, there was a, there was a train of thought and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting you to find it for me, which is perhaps <laughs> unlikely. Um, yeah. There's, 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 I can't find my own train of thought anymore. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, maybe this is this is something to 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 rest in for a moment. The 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 joy and the love. Ah, oh, there it is. The, yeah. the the learning that unfolds in taking on the teaching role. Oh yeah. Taking on the role of a facilitator. One of the reasons I do that, along with the love, along with the enjoyment of it, is I can see that it's enlightening me further, as it were. It's bringing into awareness. Uh, just as you described those shadows, perhaps areas where we're, we haven't been in the fullest love with ourselves or we haven't been in full clarity. Can you speak to that in, in your own experience, learning through teaching? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to it not only in mine, but in other teachers. Like what I've noticed is like when I was, when I, when I was kind of going through this myself, I would look for teachers who said that the, you know, don't believe me, the wisdom is inside you. Mm-hmm. So like, do your own experiment. What I notice is that if you have a teacher that is, uh, I'm really, I want to be really clear about this for anybody who's watching. So if you have a teacher that is, um, it doesn't see that you are a better representation of the truth than they are, meaning that the next step for you is more clearly in you than it is in them, right? If you don't have that in a teacher, if the teacher isn't, if at the end of the day, it's not empowering, you become independent, right? If I was a math teacher and after two years you hadn't learned calculus, you should fire me, right? Like, and if you're like dependent, then, then it doesn't work. It's unempowering. And so, so there's a lot of teachers out there that, you know, I would say, that get their intimacy needs met in a power over situation so they don't take the real risk of intimacy. There's a lot of, a lot of teachers out there that um, are accumulating power, even subtly, like, and when I say subtly, like, let's say, let's call it like an awakened state. Like if they're achieving an awakened state, then they're accumulating power. If they see the awakened state as a natural gift from the universe, that's a very different thing. And so I think in the teaching in general, the learnings for any teacher are, are going to be the, the, and for me have been, and I, I guarantee will continue to be, will be about um, how to more deeply fall in love with all the parts of myself so I can more deeply fall in love with the person across from me. The the teaching is how do I make it so that this person sees that they are just as much an expression of awakened consciousness as I am. And it's not even make them see it. That would be, an, it would be like, a, see that clearly yourself. I mean, that's, yeah, see that. Yeah. My whole job is just to clearly see that. Mm-hmm. That's my job. It is. Yeah, exactly. It's not my job. Um, and then, and then there's also like the, 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 the other side of that, which is not taking responsibility on for other people's emotional states, even if they're students, mm-hmm. right? Like, 
And the more that I can fall in love with every one of my emotions, the more I'm just, you know, they're like, I'm pissed at you. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's I love being pissed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me all about it, you know, instead of having some sort of trigger. And um, so I think a lot of teachers create this by just creating separation between them and the students. Mm -hmm. um, my methodology is very different. My methodology is to really, is like, is to create no separation between us, like to separation in the fact that we're individuals, but no separation in the fact that like we, it's like m my teaching is through vulnerability. It isn't through knowing. I don't come in and say, I know everything. Ask me a question. Yeah. I've, I've seen this model powerfully for myself with other teachers who have utilized vulnerability authentically and genuinely, but also as a means of uh, achieving something which you spoke to earlier about uh, undoing those projections. Uh, yeah, there'll be times where perhaps absorbing the, pro the projection may be the highest service, but it seems that in the general spiritual marketplace, there's a greater need for teachers to be clearer in their role to undo those projections to give people back their you're so enlightened you're so amazingness back to back to them as, as as a reflection and that seems to be like so 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 important from every perspective and yet it, i don't think it's common i think a lot of teachers clearly they, they build the the, the, the sangha they build the um power structures and they accumulate uh, often sex and and money simultaneously through elevating themselves above, above others to be something special. Yeah, it sells, baby. Mm -hmm. Like having the answers sell, you know, like I had a, 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 a student come to me, had life-changing after life-changing experience. And she had found this teacher that was kind of more of the rigid meditation, you know, teacher. And she was, she came to me, she's like, look, th this is the answer, so to speak. And I, my response was like, I understand the answer is, is it's, it's sexy and you want it. And I can't give that to you. What I can give you is a, an, an incredible lack of answers. What I can give you is the unknown. If you need an answer, this, I, I'm, I'm not the place that this isn't what I can do for you. Now I answer questions obviously, and, and there's perspective. But essentially, yeah. So there's a, there's a need or a, a market drive for prepackaged answers and for often unmet psychological needs to be found in the, in the teacher-student dynamic. And clearly being aware of all that, it's something you can exclude from, from your play, from, from your, your game. Um, and it, do, it does seem that maybe that is, uh, from a business perspective, it probably uh, diminishes your audience somewhat. Absolutely. It absolutely, yeah. I, I watch it all the time, people wanting, you know, I watch it in other teachers that are vulnerable. Like you see the whole crowd kind of like, okay, okay. And then they say something vulnerable and they're like, well, but he's not awake. <laughs> you know, right. Right. So I can't follow him because that's not perfection. Uh -huh. like, or she or whatever it is it's like that that's yeah that's super common so instead what they do is they do this hold their breath just give me a second I'm, it just takes me a second yeah so instead what they do is they speak in a way that makes it really clear that every little thing that's happening inside of you just comes and goes this is the teacher yeah this is the teacher the the the, the teacher role being taken rather than being the human that they are and speaking from awake yeah. consciousness yeah and it's good it gives you this transmission of non-duality which is, I think, a really useful tool and I think, and, and lovely. And I think every teacher has a role for some, you know, there's a group for that, that teaching. But the transmission of non-duality, stillness, emptiness, doesn't need to avoid words, doesn't need to avoid emotion, right? No. One can be chattering away and the greatest stillness is where those thoughts are arising from. Right. That's absolutely the case. But the, the, 
absolutely the case. And it's, you know, I, I'm in China and I'm sitting there and there's this billionaire who's coming to talk to me. And next to me is a Chinese Zen nun. They're allowing now. Just an, just an everyday experience in the life. Just an everyday experience. And, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she's in the robes and I'm just like me. And boom, all the attention on the awakening went to her. Like I, it was, which is fine. Like the, you know, it's like you, the rock and roll star, like dresses up like a rock and roll star and they get up on stage. Like that whole thing sets up a, sets up an entire, you know, uh, it makes the, it makes the message easy to deliver the uh -huh. robe the funny, the funny hair, the funny hat, the funny name, mm -hmm. the, like the, the slow talking. I mean, like if you watch Osho, it's like, he's using hip hypnosis techniques. Mm -hmm. He's using <laughs> hypnosis techniques. <laughs> to still your mind. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and Hey man, that's Things, awesome. Since the it world. helped me. It, it helped me. It helped the hell out of me. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So again, I'm thinking of yesterday because I, I have a similar disinterest in um, sending people to sleep or yeah. into hypnosis or into a, an idea of awakeness yeah. and to be deconstructing the role of the teacher naturally and consciously intentionally as, as, as part of the play seems to be really helpful. So when I, when I you know, just come, it's coming to mind, like <laughs> going to sit on this elevated seat yesterday and there's a microphone and there's people there expecting, you know, presumably expecting something wise or, or intelligent to be said. And what I find really helps is being in the humor of that. Like, yeah. so when, when someone said to me, how did you get here? It's like, well, that's a great question. I really have no idea. And there is, I can tell you some sort of linear story of I met this guy and this awakening and all the rest. Right. But the, the absurdity and the humor of me being in this position and taking on this role is really fully felt. And that, that allows a lightness that um, I, I feel is valuable and I feel is authentic and I feel is actually a more powerful mechanism to communicate awake consciousness, which is, of course, just this very ordinariness that we that we all yeah. are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. I just was thinking, how did you get here? You know, it was a, it was a really brutal game of Rochambeau. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. um, so many yeah, ways you I, can answer I that. I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that absolutely feels in accord, you know, there's so many ways to, to turn it on its ear. And, and for some, that's not the, that's not the thing that's that, that, that their wisdom brings them to at this moment. And for some it is. And I think the other part of it, that's the other part of it for me, that's just um, like the, the whole role of the, the teacher is it's heartbreaking. There's humor in it, but there's also just a deep heartbreak. Like if I really let myself feel into it, it's like, I, you know, the, there's a saying that says like the world is a projection, you know? And so if you're a thief, you think everybody's going to steal from you. Well, as it turns out, that doesn't really change too much when you're in love with everybody. Cause like I'm in love with everybody and I just like walk around kind of thinking other people are in love with everybody, you know, like it's kind of a, a ridiculous notion. And, the, and then when I see them treat me special, um, it breaks my heart because I, I like, can't you see what I see? Can't you see yourself through my eyes? Like, can't you see what you are? Like, that's a heartbreaker. And it's not a heartbreaker like poor them. You know, <laughs> it's, not, it's a heartbreaker just like, ah, uh, you know, <laughs> there's no better than in it. There's just like this, like. Right. And, and may more love flow through that break right right you know it's the it, it can't but not uh -huh. like the, like every time my heart breaks it increases my capacity to love mm -hmm. every time and there's there's something to speak to i've been geeking out on 
quantum mechanics again recently. I, I've yeah. um, Paul Levi's written this wonderful book, wonderful book, Quantum Revelations. He actually talks about quantum mechanics being kind of addictive. And I know there was a time way back when when I found that. And I'm kind of finding it again now. Like I'm just really geeking out on the non-duality of quantum mechanics. Yeah. When you speak of loving people, when you speak of seeing the world, you know, projecting that beautiful image, projecting that bubble out yeah. into the world such that that is your reality. Yeah. In the collective, the more people that are doing that, the more yeah. people that are being that, able to see the awake consciousness, to see God that's yeah. shining out of the other person's eyes, especially in the teacher-student scenario. Yeah. There's something immeasurably powerful about that from that perspective of consciousness um, manifesting the universe, manifesting form and the quality of the consciousness that's observing, informing the nature of that form that manifests. Yeah, there's, yes, and. So my experience is that, my friend said to me the other day that he, he said, he goes, I'm trying to cure people from non-duality. <laughs> and I don't see it quite that way, but I see it as a developmental step. You know, it's just like, you know, you, you crawl before you walk. And I think non-duality, that recognition is a beautiful insight and it relieves so much. And, and there's so much ease that comes with it. And it's, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it doesn't mean shit if you're not in love with people. If you, mm -hmm. if you don't fall in love with people just because they're people, if that isn't happening, if you're like, you know, like, like, distant and compassionate but i don't even know what the fuck that means but that seems to be the case like mm -hmm. like yes they have the idea that they love everybody but their heart's not breaking right, right? because heartbreaking would be that i was actually in duality and i was in my personality like but like that's what a lot of that the people in that stage think it's like it doesn't mean much without that i mean it's a great stage of development but it's like it's like it's that falling in love part that's, I think, really critical. It's, I've seen people in a non-dual thing, you know, Osho is an example of it. I, I'm not saying he's a bad man or a good man, but, but there's a lot of harm that was done there. And um, I haven't seen people deeply in love do that kind of thing. Right. And, that, and I that, don't mean love like romantic love. I mean love like, yeah, love. you should. Yeah, it's love. Yeah. yeah, real love. Yeah, that, that's that's where my heart breaks is observing within non-dual circles or within supposedly awakened on the edge of consciousness on the realization of truth, where there's this distance or or an intellectual insight that's that's, and often it's a genuine, I would assume, insight of emptiness or insight of no self, and it's actually utilized in a subtle form of violence to beat people over the head with how they think they exist and I know that I don't, this sort, of, uh, yeah. this sort of separation. And this feels to me to be speaking to that integration and that full awakening through the entire body, through the heart, through the gut, such that the awake consciousness that we are can enjoy the awake consciousness that's before us. Yeah. Rather than the, hey, I'm, I'm awake. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember for me when I was in that like place of, you know, kind of where I just discovered the non-personal space, that non-dual space. And, um, and then I was like reading, I, you know, I, I got into this idea that in Google, you should always search for the thing that you think isn't true to see what the other point of view is so that you're not in your like echo bubble. And so I said, reality is, or enlightenment is false, right? And then I read this thing, it was called depersonalization disorder, which is the number four, number four most diagnosed disease. And, and, and so if you go, go ahead, go online, go to the depersonalization disorder website, go to the chat group, the chat group, then it says, went the onset and read people's first person experiences of the onset. It's exactly like enlightenment. It is exactly, it is like, it's like you just pull that shit straight out of Zen texts and Buddhist texts and Christian texts. It's just like the experiences are almost identical. The difference is one group is like, aren't I special? Because not that I'm special because I don't exist, but aren't I special that I see this world this way? And the other group is like, 
what the fuck is this? Make it stop. But the same experience is happening again. Like the roller coaster is occurring. And so for me, for me, I, I great for anybody to go through whatever they want to go through. And mm -hmm. for me, the joy is in, is in the heartbreak. It's in the love. Yeah. Similarly, I, I was in a conversation with a forensic psychiatrist ah. and she said that she was really struck by her first encounter with a group of uh, non-duality people because they were right out of the textbook. Depressed. Um, depressed and dissociative. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, this, this is, there's a, there's a humor, a lightness in this from a sort of cosmic perspective. And the answer, yeah, I, I, I feel you and hear you and want to join you in this, in this yeah. love and this heart awakening and this humanity and this vulnerability and this truth of the, the whole human experience with its desire to fuck, with its desire to yeah. create, with its desire to make money and with its desire to, to, to serve within that as well. I, Absolutely. I, I, bringing yeah. us back to the start of the conversation, you spoke very nicely that there's not really a divergence of uh, your um, financial world and your personal development world or, or your service and that they're very much integrated and can be the same thing. Yeah. And that's a powerful message is that one can, one can have it all. You can be in service and you can have financial security and you can have sexual pleasure as well. This is possible within the human condition. Yeah. Yeah. What an idea that it wouldn't be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joining that religion. I'm not joining. Right. That exactly. Exactly. Yeah. right. But, it, but it's so funny because because I was just thinking how this, this conversation we're having isn't actually going to sell very well. And, and because it's not going to sell really well because it's like, there's no answer here, right? Like, even though we say you can have it all, it's all available to you. There's not like the, the clear answer of, of like, this is what you do and this is how you get there. And right? it's like, if, in, in, in the way my world works is you're just constantly tearing apart everything you believe in. Mm -hmm. You're just deconstructing everything you believe in. Let's deconstruct enlightenment. Let's deconstruct non-duality. Let's deconstruct money. Let's deconstruct. And then there's just this freedom. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that doesn't sell. <laughs> you know? Like, and like, it, let, let me tell you how you can be aligned in your money. Let's just deconstruct the shit out of it. Like, let's just show you how it's a complete fucking piece of illusion. And it doesn't sell necessarily to a large section of the spiritual market to put the ball back in their court and say, your enlightenment is entirely your business, happy to play and explore and be in conversation. But ultimately, it's your responsibility, just as making your money is and just as yeah. developing your, your sexual consciousness is as well. And with that said, it's not like I'm having any hard time finding, you know, work or an mm -hmm. audience or, you know, People who, I mean, like my stuff sells out and I have, you know, six or seven times as much demand as I have the capacity to do. But it's, it's definitely an easier sell to say, let me fix what's wrong with you. Right. That's, that's the easy sell. And, and the harder sell is to say, there's nothing wrong with you. And I don't have an answer. And speaking of your sold out offerings, I know that you've got some upcoming weekend courses happening around the place. Can I invite you to share a little bit about that with our audience? Yeah. So the, my real passion is the 18 month courses and mm -hmm. the longer courses. I have a week long course. That's the real passion. Um, I do the weekend courses so people can get an experience of it. And then from there we curate the 18 month course pretty heavily. So we make sure that it's like, I, I like working with people that I want to work with. So I, I handpick the people and that makes for really, a really good group of folks mm -hmm. um, for the longer 18 month course. Uh, I keep them reasonably affordable because I don't have a strong need for the money. Um, and uh, the weekend course is all about conflict. It's, it's basically how do you fall in love with conflict and enjoy it? And how do you figure out, Every time I have conflict, it means that I get to transform and I will. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And so that, so conflict is, is anger, conflict, totally natural. We all do it. Like, how do you fall in love with it? And then, and then the week long course is all about the shame voice in the head. It's all about the voice in our head. That's telling us what to do, how to do it. If it was good, if it's not good, like that kind of self abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't think you have it, you do just, saying to the audience um mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that, that's all about tools to deconstruct that. And then the, the 18 month course is just a business and spirituality. It's basically how do we just all the tools that we can use to break down limiting perspectives and what does that mean to business and what are the business tools we can use that actually help us, um, awaken further. Like a good business tool also helps people wake up. You, you can sell or you can sell in a way that actually helps people wake up. You can market or you can market in a way that actually helps people wake up. And typically if you can combine those things, you make for a better tool because the truth is people want freedom. So if you give them something that gives them freedom, you, you have a deeper relationship and therefore the business works better. Right. So that's what that is. And in terms of finding out details, specifics, locations, and so on, joehudson.com is the place to go? Yeah, that's it. Sweet. Yeah. Joe, it's been a, a joy being in dialogue with you as always. Too uh, short. Always too short. Yeah, right. Thank you for giving us the time today, and I look forward to spending more time with you in person soon. Yeah, I love you, Will. It's good to see your face, even if it's virtually. Love you too, brother. Okay. Love you too. Right. Thank you to our guests for joining our production today. If you've enjoyed this dialogue and would like to support the creation of more similar programming and feel resonance with the call to be of service to an emergent human culture, please join us, loveandtruthparty.org. Download Love Letters, sign up for our newsletter, like and follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and consider a financial gift at loveandtruthparty.org. Thank you to all our supporters and contributors. Together we are creating kind, conscious, courageous human community.